starting a new series, at least a one-week series, okay? We'll see where this goes. Uh, a one-week series. Um, uh, I'll tell you how this came about. Um, I had this brilliant idea, you know, for a, for a, a new book. And uh, it was called Buckling Swash. And it was, you know, finding your adventure in ordinary life. And I sent that off to the publisher, and they came back to me with, heck no. <laughs> Forget that. Man, that's terrible. That will sell no copies, you know, and <laughs> very clearly. And, uh, and that hurt my feelings. I was wounded by that. I thought, doggone it, here I have a real brilliant idea, and it just, you know. And uh, so Thursday, I met with the other, she, she was out here, um, and we had dinner, and uh, she said, you know, what we really want is what you had for chapter four. Your title for chapter four, now, but we want that. We don't want any of the rest of it. Just make chapter four of the new book. And I went, oh, I don't know, I have to look in the Bible and see if there's anything that relates to this. I don't even know if it's true. Uh, chapter four was, when everything goes wrong, the adventure begins. Does that ring true? Oh, I hate this when they're right. Oh man, here I was pouting. And uh, so I, I went to the Bible to see, are there any examples of something like that where everything goes wrong, but then, you know, something happens and God gets involved and actually the adventure begins. And you know what I found? There's a lot of stuff in the Bible about that. Old Testament, New Testament, there is a lot of people where everything goes wrong and then God intervenes and the adventure begins. I'm shocked. I guess that's why they pay the editors that big money. But um, so anyway, uh, I want to. I picked one for today um, in Luke chapter 15. It's a it's a parable that you all know. You all know so well. Even if you uh, randomly go to church, you still know this. I, I bet. Uh, beginning in verse 11, Jesus said, "There was a man who had two sons." The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs getting the idea that everything's going wrong with him. Uh, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. We'll have a feast and we'll celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they all celebrate. Meanwhile, the older brother, which I think I've told you, uh, the word there in Greek um, is the word for Presbyterian. Isn't that weird? That's just strange. Anyway, the, just a thought. I don't know where that came from. But meanwhile, the older brother was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother's come, he said. Your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry, outraged, and refused to go in. So his father went out to him and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fat calf for him. 
Son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. And he was lost and is found. So pray with me. Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Teach us how we might live. Teach us how we might trust you and teach us how we might find you and have you find us in the middle of when everything goes wrong. Show us that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, anybody grow up in a family? <laughs> <laughs> or have the presence of mind to begin your own family? <laughs> you know how that happens. It's almost a generational thing. It's families. Um, things don't always work out the way we think they will, right? It's... Uh, no matter how good our intentions are. I got this note this, uh, this week. Uh, dear John, I'll, I'll, I'll edit it a little bit. Um, I feel so blessed that you chose our retreat uh, to come speaking. Um, uh, you have way more to offer than you know. <laughs> anyway, um, we thought about the phrase children are for suffering. It, it struck a loud chord for us. We have two sons, 41 and 43, and three grandchildren. All local, no marriages. Uh, God has done amazing things in our sons' lives and in ours, and it's only by his grace that we've kept on in faith. Drugs, court, prison, we've been there. Five years ago, our church in so-and-so town had a meltdown, and we left our church family. Truly, it was our family of almost 30 years. Uh, they were led different places. Um, much of our story is not a typical church conversation. A friend gave me a t-shirt that says, quote, always remember, as far as everyone knows, we are a nice, normal family. <laughs> as far as anyone knows, uh, we send our squeeziest hugs and heartfelt prayers to you, your dear wife, and Damien, uh, your wonderful son. Uh, Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And then, great is the Lord, which we sang to today. P.S. I'm the short, curly-haired one in the front row who told you we once lived in Walnut Creek. Isn't that interesting? Families. Um, We've been there. There's something that happens in them. And I think Jesus picked this story to tell for a reason. It resonates with us more than most things in Scripture. There's something about love and resentment and competition and the way we look at things that swirls around in our lives and it shapes us. And, and it may be that these relationships become kind of a focused window where we can see our life maybe a little closer and we can see how God reaches us a little closer. And that's, that's what I want us to look at in this, in this parable that Jesus tells. Um, obviously, the prodigal son. Everybody knows about the prodigal son. It's always the bad one. It's always the young one. Uh, <laughs> you know. Um, and... Uh, I was the younger son who was the bad one, so I, I, I've always related to that, you know. And uh, they knew that someday I'd become like someone else and God could use me. Um, God still used me, but I never did become like someone else. But there's something about this, I want what I want, I want it now, I want to take control of my life. And I believe that that young son believed with all of his heart that his adventure was beginning at that point. This is where the adventure begins. I get what's coming to me. I don't have to wait. I can do it now. I can live my way. I'm not going to be under the constraints of the family. I'm not going to be under uh, anything. I can live my own way. And, and he says he went to a far country. As far away as he could get from that family environment. And I think he thought as he headed out the gate, I'm on an adventure. This is great. I don't think he thought my life's ruined now. I think he thought, this is great. Finally, I can do it my way. I don't need anybody. I don't need anybody. I've got what's coming to me. Boom. And of course, then immediately it says, well, he squandered it all on 
wild living, and, you know. Fortunately, scripture doesn't go into exactly what that means, although the older brother brings up some of it. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, and life spirals down. Now the thing is that uh, in, in our personal lives, our spiritual lives, and in our uh, relationships, and, and in organizations, it's true in organizational theory, and in churches, there's a thing called a death spiral, right? And that is where you're going along and you make a decision, and that decision takes you lower. And then you make another decision, maybe to fix it, and that takes you lower. And then another decision, because the decisions you're making are all in sync with the death spiral. And, and we've watched companies go down the drain. I mean, we're watching now with J.C. Penney, you know. Everybody remember pennies at one time? And, uh, and they made one mistake after another after another. And now the last one was to lie to everybody and give false financial records until there's going to be no more pennies. That's a death spiral. Some of you have seen it in churches. Some of you have experienced it in your own life. Now, the only way out of a death spiral, there's only one way out. You know what it is? Make a different decision. That's the only way out. That's the only thing that will reverse a death spiral. Instead of doing what you would normally decide, you have to stop and make an opposite kind of decision. So here we have the brother make it, going spiraling down, spiraling down. Now he's broken. Now the, the famine's in the land. There's no opportunities. He's lost all his money. He's squandered everything. His friends are gone. His uh, love interests are gone. And uh, <laughs> food's gone. And he's working uh, in the farm feeding the pigs, which is, uh, the pigs probably are uncomfortable with him there. <laughs> you know, but, um, uh, He has the issue of, do I just keep doing this? Do I just keep doing this? And, it, and one translation says, he suddenly came to himself. I like that phrase. He came to himself. It suddenly, what the heck am I doing? And he didn't have a plan for going back to what he was, he just thought, you know, if I'm going to be a, a servant or a slave somewhere, at least the slaves back in my father's home were well fed. So I could go back as a slave. I've, I've already lost my inheritance and everything, but I could go and be a servant there. And he began to make one new decision. And then it says he, he got up and went back towards home and back towards and, and he started making new decisions. And, and I bet every step of the way, every once in a while, he'd stop and go, oh, I don't know. Maybe I could still make it work back there. At least I have a job back there, you know. And, and, and he's probably torn as he's going. No, maybe, well, no, I'm going to keep going towards the Father. That's a great image, isn't it? And, and that, that's the way the story goes. Now, that's someone whose life, everything goes wrong. And it's so visible. It's so tangible. I don't know when that happened with us. Um, uh, we lost all of our finances. We lost, our credit crashed. We lost our home. We lost a job. We lost friends. We lost everything, you know. And, uh, and it was so visible. I thought, wow, you know, the shame in all this is that everybody sees what a, what a train wreck my life is you know you can't hide it because it's it's visible and um, but you have the elder brother who's very interesting because everything is wrong in his life that's the point everything is wrong but it's internal see he's got the thing that that our friend wrote me in the note here as far as everyone knows we're a nice normal family so he had the image up, he was back home, he said he was doing everything right, he was, uh, you know, working hard, keeping everything together, he wasn't like the one who ran away. And yet, inside, internally now, where no one can see what's going on, he's rotting away. Anger, bitterness, resentment, he's stewing about it, and... Why is this, and why is my life not working out the way I wanted it to be? And I don't get it, nobody gives me, and, and he's got this whole thing. Everything is wrong in his life, just like the younger brother, except no one can see. 
Now, you know what I love about this, this uh, story that Jesus tells? The father, we always picture the father running down the road. You're seeing the younger son from the distance. You know, did you get that story in Sunday school? And then he runs down the road, you know, to, to love on him, you know. And we always like that. But it also says that the father saw the older brother standing out in the field, refusing to come to the party. And what's he do? He runs out to see him too. And to love on him too. It doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're uh, externally ruining things or if you're internally ruined. It doesn't matter. The father is coming out to love you either way and saying, come into the party. You belong here. I love you. Now, the, the older brother has this really, uh, he, you know, okay, so if you re remember Adam and Eve, you ever heard of them? Remember that way back in the Bible here at the very beginning? Remember when, when, when uh, they, they sin and everything's bad and Adam, they're hiding and God says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm hiding, you know, because I was afraid of you, you know. And, uh, and then Adam had this great thing. He's, when God said, what happened? He goes, that woman that you <laughs> gave me. <laughs> That's the problem, you know. It wasn't me. It wasn't anything I did. It's that woman that you, you gave me, right? So here's, here's the, the older brother, echoing Adam's sentiment, right? What's he say? That son of yours, <laughs> yeah, that son of yours took all your fortune, took your money and squandered it on prostitutes in case you didn't know dad what wild living meant. Yeah, and uh, that's what that son of yours did with your money. love that the father says you know your brother was dead and now he's alive it's your brother not just my son we're connected in this now I think about this because you know we can look really good on the surface everything can be going great but on the inside, we're broken. We're not, it's not working. Everything's gone wrong. But because it's on the inside, people can't see it so much. They don't notice it. So we can go a lot longer getting by. But you know who knows it? The Father. The Lord knows it and said, you know, I don't want you to live in this broken state I want you to, to know that you're loved and you're valued and you belong and, and, and you belong with me and everything that I have is yours. That's what I want you to know. Now the older son was not able to break, as far as we know when the story ends, was not able to break his own death spiral. As far as we know, he stayed out in the field. Resenting, stewing, feeling sorry for himself, being bitter, missing the party, and resenting the fact that there was even a party that he's missing. Because he couldn't stop and do something different, like the younger son did. So, I was thinking about this this week. And it reminded me of something that we did um, years ago. Actually, it was when I was a pastor at University Press. And we decided as a, as a crazy idea that we would have a backpacking trip for the young adults, except that instead of carrying everything on your back, we were going to rent llamas, have a llama packing trip. Does that sound fun? You know, because you don't have to carry anything. You're just walking along, and the llama's going to go, okay, carrying everything. And so we went out to, uh, hired a, a guide with a team of llamas and loaded everything up. And, uh, and I, didn't, I didn't actually go. I was preaching that weekend. But um, I set the thing up, and then everybody went off on this trip. Woohoo! You know. And evidently, the first night, they made camp. You know, middle of fires, everything up. They were talking about, oh, this is great. Here we are, we're doing this, you know. 
I don't know if any of you have ever gone on a hike or something, you know, but I never have, but you know, <laughs> I've read about it. So anyway, and, and they, they're doing this, there, and then it was time to put the fire out and sleep, and uh, people from the church group were all concerned because the llamas were just there and they're not tied up. And what if they run off in the night or they hear a noise and they get afraid? And aren't you going to do something, you know, to the guide? And the guide said, oh, don't worry about it. And he, he took a uh, small, light uh, nylon rope. And he tied, wrapped it around a tree, and then he went over to another tree and wrapped around it about uh, shoulder high. And then he wrapped another tree, and pretty soon he'd surrounded the llamas with this little rope, about shoulder high, one little rope. Said, okay, let's go to bed. And they're going, what? Uh, they're just gonna go. You know, what's that gonna do? It's gonna scare them because it's a little nylon rope? And the guide said, oh no, you don't understand. Two things you need to know about llamas. They stand tall and they spit at you. Those are the two things you need to know. <laughs> Thanks for that. And uh, Here's a sermon memory and uh, <laughs> seared into your brain. And so uh, what happens is the llamas will walk up to the nylon rope and then stop. And they won't lower their head even a few inches to go underneath it to freedom. All they had to do was bow their head and go under the rope. It wasn't even... I mean, it was like this high. They just had to tuck a little bit, a few inches, and they would be free. But they wouldn't do it. And so they stayed corralled because they wouldn't lower their head. Now, see, you're way ahead of me on this. You know where this is going. Oh, my goodness. I thought of the church. <laughs> oh, that's what happened to me. I thought of the church. I couldn't help it. I thought, what do we do? We stand tall and we spit at each other. That's what we do. Oh, yeah. Mm, we got llama Christianity. Yeah. What idiots. You know, all we have to do is bow our head and we're free. All we have to do is stop standing tall, waiting for something to happen. And when we lower our head, we can go. The adventure begins at that point. But instead, too often, you know, I find myself all bound up and hung up, and I'm going, well, yeah, Lord, why don't you make me more free? Lord, I'm going to, you know, and he's going, come on, all you have to do is just lower your head, and you're free. Well, I'm not doing that, Lord, but anything else you want me to do that I can? <laughs> so what's this mean? It's surprisingly easy. The younger son got to the point, and he, and he squandered it. You know, his, his life was a mess, super train wreck. And all he had to do was get to the point where he came to himself, and lowered his head and said, I don't have anything coming, but I need grace. I need grace. The older brother couldn't do that. He stayed in the llama pen, still out there probably now, standing tall. Today we come to the Lord's table at Jesus' invitation, and it is our opportunity, a tangible opportunity for us to bow our head, isn't it? To say, Lord, our life is in you. It's not in our cleverness, our ability, our strength, our resourcefulness, uh, our ingenuity. It's none of that. Our life is in you, Lord. Have your way in us. Bring your grace. Bring your healing. Bring your answers. Bring your new decisions. Bring your adventure to this train wreck of a life I have.